Good afternoon, Santa Clarita, and everyone streaming in from around the world. You are listening to a special broadcast today at your hometown station, KHTS. My name is Sharon Brubaker, and I'm a certified grief recovery specialist. I'm here with my hero, Alex Urbina, a transformational coach. And for the last four months, we've been doing this special broadcast, which has absolutely been amazing to help everyone in our community. If you're listening to this broadcast today, there's a huge probability that your heart is broken. It could be from death or divorce or another loss that we wouldn't even try to understand. Alex and I are not here to tell you why your heart is breaking, but we are here to tell you that we know what a broken heart feels like, and we will be sharing some of our losses and how we got through that. Correct, Alex? Yeah, absolutely. I'm starting to learn you know, a lot more about grieving and how much grieving I have actually had in my past and not really uh, learned you know, how to do it in a healthy way. A lot of what I'm realizing is I didn't even know I was grieving. Yeah. Um, because as I learned more about the grieving process and realizing how much it's tied up into loss and how much I've actually lost and didn't realize I, w- I was losing at the time. So it was a very uh, big eye-opener for me. And hopefully through these discussions, we can open up other possibilities for other people to see and they can get their own healing done. Absolutely. I... Uh a few months back, uh, sat in on one of your programs, a transformational program, and I was just so blown away by how much uh, just going through transformation, completing a relationship in grief is a transformational process, and how we come to that point, they mirror each other, and that's why together we're able to work so closely and, and help people that are grieving. Guys, we have a special show today. Over the last four months, uh, we started out with Vegas, the uh, shooting in Las Vegas, and our heart just goes out to our community here with everyone that was affected by that. But that's how we even came together doing the show. But through that, we've been getting a lot of emails from people asking us questions. So I just want to remind everybody, we are Facebook Live. Uh, Alex and I are here. We would love it if you have any questions, just drop them in that Facebook Live. If we can't get to those questions on the air today, we'll make sure we go back, Alex and and I, and answer them. But we've gathered some questions over the time. People have been sending us emails with different questions, and we got permission from a few of them to actually present them on the air today and share those questions. So I thought it would be a good time for us to go over those. Yeah, I think it's a great idea because in my coaching practice – I actually tell my clients the best way to get the best coaching and have the biggest breakthrough is to tell on yourself. (laughs) What I mean by that is to explain to me what's going on, but also do it in question form. So, for example, if you're struggling with something and you want me to support you in it, I'm going to say, well, come up with a question. Right. And a lot of times what's amazing is that the, the, the ego inside of all of us won't allow ourselves to come up with a question. It seems to be one of the most challenging things as a human being is to come up with a question because then we got to face the possibility that I might need help. Right. Or I got to look at the possibility that I don't have all the answers. Yes. I also have to be willing, if I come up with a question, is to actually have to deal with it, right? Right. So asking a question is very powerful. And for me, it's very inspiring when people ask questions because it takes a lot of courage. Yeah. But in you asking that question as a coach, it tells me a lot about where you're at. Yeah. And then I and then by you asking that question and me knowing where you're at, then I can meet you exactly where you're at. And then we can uh, handhold each other and just kind of go through that process together. But I'm not going to just start coaching you blindly and just start throwing stuff out that I think you need. I want you to tell me where you're at. So I love these questions because as they're writing, they're saying a lot about where they are. Yes. And you as the expert, I want you to kind of cherry pick and explain where they're at because of what they're saying and the questions that they're asking. And for the people that are listening, it also gives them insight to kind of hear how you can see some of the stuff in in what they're writing to you. That and also, um, what about the person that's too scared to ask their question, mm. right? They're the, they're the ones that are sitting at home and their hearts are absolutely broken, but they're just too scared to step forward or they didn't think it was a safe place 
or they felt like it was okay. They just had to sit and suffer alone. These questions are also for you. Well, those are the best breakthroughs yeah. because you can hide behind someone else's question. And right. go, Oh, that's a good one. I need to hear what you got to say right. about that. Right. So it's good. And just so we set up a safe place and because grief recovery is confidential, we're not going to share anyone's name. We're just going to share their story. But the first question was actually, um, this young lady sent me a quite a long letter, but I'm going to go ahead and read this, Alex. There's a lot of components to this letter. So um, she says, Sharon, I have never had a person close to me die until five years ago when my ex-husband was killed in a car accident. About a year later, my mother died of a brain aneurysm. I had um, just returned from a business trip and was intending on visiting her, but didn't have a chance to. My best friend of 15 years died of cancer this year. My father is very ill, and we are not expecting him to make it to the end of the year. I feel numb and distant. I do not attend any social events. I did not know. I, I know that this sounds crazy, but I go to the cemetery often and sit at my girlfriend's graveside. I've recently started reading the obituaries daily, something that I've never done in the past. My younger brother is starting to struggle and fall apart. I do not know how to help him because I can't even help myself. I have a religious background, but I'm not even going to church. I feel so lost. I don't even know what my question is. Can you please help? So um, I absolutely have reached out to this young lady, but she did give me permission to share her letter on the air. So there's a lot of components here. There's a lot. She has a lot going on. So let's just start at the beginning. And the fact that is that um, she had never experienced a loss and her ex-husband died. So the question I would have right there, if she were sitting with me, was what was your relationship like with your ex-husband? Where were you at with him? Had you completed your relationship with him? Were there things in that relationship that she needed to complete with him? Did she get a chance to forgive him for all the wrongs that he had done? Did she get a chance to apologize for the things that she had done wrong, right? A lot of times what happens in a divorce situation, we end in such a painful way that we're not even talking anymore, right? And then he dies, and we realize there's stuff for us to share and say. Yeah, and the transformational arena, we call them withholds. Right. So there's a lot of... There's a lot of components that go into relationships because we're interacting with each other a right. lot. So in a, in that essence, we get our feelings hurt. Yeah. Um, we get uh, we feel like we got wronged. Right. We feel like things have happened that you have done these things to me. Right. And so out of the effect of that, I have a lot of resentment. And I have a lot of things that I wanted to tell you or didn't have the courage to tell you. So what I do is I hold on to them, and it's called a withhold. I'm withholding this information from you. And then all of a sudden they die on us. Yeah. And now I don't have the opportunity to get those withholds to complete them or to surrender them or, or run its course. So now I'm feeling, I'm walking around feeling so heavy because I have a bag full of withholds that I still need to complete. Right. So grief, remember, keeping the definition of grief is anything that we want it to be better, different, or more. Any loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations. So here she has these hopes and dreams of finally being able to say this one day, but possibly not being able to say that, ever, ever getting to that point. Or just uh, closing that area in her life, completing that one area that I'm sure, I'm, I, I've never been divorced, but left some emptiness in there absolutely right and there's a lot of there's a lot of beliefs surrounding uh completing some uh, communication that you never really got the chance yeah. to do and i find it interesting that most people think that they actually have to do that completion with someone standing right in front of you yeah or at least knowing that the other person's on the other end of the line yeah and in the recovery and the healing that i've been working with people for over 20 years i've come to realize that you can actually complete without the other person. Yeah. Uh, we can do it in different ways, like uh, writing a letter or right. or, or saying it out loud. Yes. Or we can still communicate. and doesn't have to have the person right in front of us. In fact, the withhold and the completing is really not necessary for the other person. If, if you're lucky enough to have the person there and you're courageous enough to go, it could be a very powerful healing yes. moment and, and a re-engaging and a brand new relationship 
from that healing. I agree. But it's not necessary to have that person there. Absolutely. Because remember, recovery from loss is an inside job. It's about what's broken in your heart. It's not about what's broken in their heart. Yes, you can have a powerful conversation with someone, Alex, but what happens when you're all teed up, you're ready to go to have this powerful conversation, and you say, you walk up to them and you say, I forgive you for that time you left me on the side of the road and you didn't pick me up three times when we were married. And then he looks at you and says, that never happened. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? That's yeah, why. You, could, you, 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 risk, you risk the possibility of being rejected yes. and then getting hurt again. Yeah. And then creating another withhold, yeah. another regret. Yeah, so, so it could go either way. Yeah. So we, and, and, and some people in a lifetime will never uh, evolve to the place to be able to be compassionate enough to even have that yeah. kind of a closing with you. So yeah. it, it, I love the, the fact that we could actually cause that healing within ourselves and we don't actually need the other person to participate in it. It's so powerful. So totally powerful. So then, let's see, she goes on to say that a year later, her mom died of a brain aneurysm. I, this is not actually in her letter, but I know this from uh, speaking with her, that um, it happened late one night, and it was suddenly, of course, they didn't know it was coming, and it just suddenly happened. She had planned on going to visit her mom and had a trip planned, but wasn't able to make it there. So now, I want to show you, because I talk about this a lot, that grief is cumulative and it's cumulatively negative. And here is an example of that right here. So for example, her, the, she's not complete from her ex-husband's car accident and then a year later her mom dies. Now I've got all this broken heart from my ex-husband and now my mom has died. What do you think happens? It attaches and now I've got an even bigger hole in my heart. But what's holding her back here, and this is one of the words that you and I talk about a lot, is the guilt that she feels that she didn't go and see her before. So there's a lot going on in that trip that, that happened. Why did I go on the business trip? Why didn't I go and see mom? Why didn't I schedule that trip before? You see what, what's happening here? And she absolutely uses the word guilt there. And we know for a fact that the definition of guilt is with intent to deceive or do harm. And so that's one of the areas that we need to take from her and make her realize that here is the loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations. Everything that I wanted to be so different, but it wasn't there. And the still the things, again, I need to say to mom. Yeah, and a lot of times when people ask me or they're, they're stuck because they're living in the what if or the why didn't I. Yeah. Um, sometimes I can help them unstick themselves with the simple answer of because you just didn't. Yeah. And, and, and if we can just stick with, okay, I just didn't and stop there yeah. without making up all these other stories, right. then we can heal from that. But I think as human beings, we live in the, why didn't I, and then, or how come I didn't. And then we go on this whole road of psychoanalyzing yes. it, which, which could drive us nuts yeah. and create more pain and more discomfort and, you know, more sadness. But the bottom line is, is that if you didn't do something, you just didn't do it for, yeah. there is no reason. There's no yeah. rhyme or reason. It's just, it, it didn't happen. And it wasn't actually supposed to happen. And the only right. reason why I know that is because it didn't, Yeah, you know, life, life is the way it unfolds is if it was supposed to happen, it would have. And if it didn't, it was because it wasn't supposed to. And when you start learning some of those distinctions about the universe, you just get really clear and you don't go down that road beating yourself up for a coulda, woulda, shoulda. That those things don't even yeah. really exist. It's yeah. something that we create psychologically to keep punishing ourselves. Right. And we don't need to go down that road and do that. And what I, well, you and I talk about this a lot. The fact that she didn't go on the trip is just neutral. It was not that she didn't get to make it to see her mom that one more time, even though in the moment she won't understand this. And as we go through it, she won't understand it. But the fact that I didn't get on the plane is neutral. It's not good or bad. It, it's like you said, it, it just happened. It is. it is what it is, yeah. right? And then we decide what emotion we're going to attach to that. Yeah, because think about it. Had her mom not passed away, right? she wouldn't be sitting there psychoanalyzing yes. saying, I, you know, I should have, could have, would have. Yeah. It just would have been what it is, which yeah. is I just didn't go. I agree. So it, 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 it always comes up when we don't have those opportunities anymore anymore to take advantage of right. or, or to really jump in and, and, and own them in a beautiful way. We always, for some reason, as human beings, we go back and we want to beat ourselves up for them. And 
that whole beat up process is yeah. not necessary. You're yeah. supposed to be your own champion. Right. You're supposed to be healing yourself, not re aggravating and re uh, injuring yourself and re battering yourself. That's not the purpose of that. Right. Sometimes what I hear here, and I'm going to uh, go to an- another subject here, but it's we heard it a lot with people in Vegas. Why didn't I go back? That this loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations, anything that I could have done differently. I hear it a lot in the medical field when people have family members that die. I could have saved them. I could have saved them. So that it's just that area. And that is one area when you're doing your completion work that we absolutely address. And I help you complete that one area where it's concerned with mom or your family member or why I didn't go back. And we look at that one area and we complete that one area. Here she says, I had a f- my best friend of 15 years has just recently died of cancer. So now she's got another grief and a loss on top of the three she's already had. So now this hole in her heart is continuing to get bigger. Now think of, I'm going to go back to the ex-husband. Now some of the things that were left there unsaid and unspoken are now attaching to this grief as well. My father is very ill and we're not expecting him to make it to the end of the year, which now start, we start to throw in fear. He's going to leave me now as well. These other things are starting to happen. She says, I feel numb. It is not uncommon for us to feel numb and not want to do social events when we're going through our grieving process. And it's completely okay. We have to set up our grieving process for us, and we have to do what's right for us. She feels numb and distant and not wanting to do social events. Let me ask you a question. When people say, I feel numb, and I'm just playing devil's advocate because that's what I do best, right, is to open up possibilities. Could it be possible that we're not really feeling numb? We're just feeling different than the way we've normally felt. So we we give it a feeling called numb. Yeah. Um, because we don't know how to identify that I feel sad. I feel heartbroken. Yes. So can we create uh, these false labels for things that aren't real? Like like you said about the guilty. Yes. Some people don't know how to just say my heart hurts. So yeah. we attach uh, a label called I feel guilty. I feel guilty or I feel numb. I, I believe that when I agree with you that if the if we continue four or five months later and we're saying I feel numb, absolutely. It, we need to search inside of our heart and find what those emotion words are and try to attach those emotion words to them that fit us, each and every person, right? But it is not uncommon immediately following a loss or a tragedy to feel numb. I also believe that that is the process that the body goes through because if we really fully accepted what has really the happened pain. to us, the pain, we would be on the floor. I, d- I don't think that we're able. So a little bit so seeping like, at a time. Like, so it's almost like f- when you physically get hurt, your body has a, a, a mechanism to numb the pain yeah. to some degree yeah. because if you felt the full brunt of, of the pain that came from a broken leg or right. something like that, and that's maybe our body goes into that shock, right? It yeah. kind of it dulls it out a little bit because it knows that we can't really uh, withhold or, or stand the full pain of it. I agree. Also, in part of that numbness we may be feeling, right? So let's say we have a tragedy and we have a numb, we have this numb feeling, which definitely comes over us. Then let's say two hours after we found out about the tragedy, we're sitting with a friend and we're laughing. A lot of times we can feel bad about that. Oh my gosh, my loved one's not here, and I'm laughing. Whereas the, the, the numbness wears off. It kind of goes in a roller coaster. We absolutely go uh, the roller coaster of emotions. So you can absolutely be right after a tragedy, laughing, talking, crying, sitting, staring. There's all of these things that can be happening and I immediately think th- after. I think when we, when we start to feel bad, it's only because we're in judgment of yes. what we're feeling. Yeah. We're giving it a judgment instead of yeah. saying, no matter what I feel, it's okay to feel whatever comes up. Whatever comes in up. In each moment. And if I'm going to cry right now, that's where I'm going to be at. If I'm going to be laughing right now, that's where I'm going to be at. And that you kind of have to go with each thing as it's happening, right? Respectfully. I think respectfully, you don't want to be the person that's come there as a support in the corner laughing. Before we go on a break, I'm going to share kind of a funny story. My my father, um, he had cancer, and right towards the end of his life there, there were some touch-and-go moments. We were in the hospital, and me and my mom were at the hospital, and we were, like, just, you know, like, stunned and, like, in fear and, like, you know, crying and worried about my dad. 
and my sister was sitting there. She was hungry, so she went out to Carl's Jr., and she was sitting there right next to his bed eating a sandwich. <laughs> you know, she was eating on her burger. And me and my mom looked at each other, and we were like, who does that? <laughs> who does that? But, but it yeah. really opened my eyes to go, you know what? Everyone deals with yeah. tragedy and loss and pain and their fears in different ways. Later on, when my dad actually pa- passed away, my other sister kind of checked out. Yeah. You know, she, so I had to learn quickly to, to really fight being in judgment of right. how they chose to deal with it because we all deal with it in different yeah. ways. It was, it was a, a very big breakthrough for me to not right. go into judgment and make somebody bad oh, and yeah. wrong because they were, the way they chose to deal with it was to eat something, you know. So it, it was it was a funny story in our family. Oh, we yeah. laugh and we give my sister cute. a hard time. <laughs> yeah, when we come back, stay tuned, everybody, because when we come back, I'd like to come right back to that hamburger story <laughs> and finish up. I have someone there. Thank you, guys. We're going to be checking out for a second. KHTS, your hometown station. Drugs or alcohol abuse can tear a family apart. In Santa Clarita, just like everywhere else, it's an epidemic. The Way Out Recovery is here to help. Call them now at 296-4444 or visit them on the web at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. The Way Out offers outpatient treatment for adolescents, adults, and family members. The Way Out is compassionate, caring, professional, and confidential. You and your family don't have to suffer any longer. Call The Way Out Recovery now, 296-4444 or visit thewayoutrecoveryscv.com and make an appointment. Asking for help is the first step. Remember when you and your sweetheart would go ice skating, gliding across the ice hand in hand? Well, relive those magical moments at Ice Station Valencia during any of our daily public sessions. The Ice Station Coffee Club, our Monday to Friday noontime skate for adults only, is a great place to socialize while getting in healthy ice skating exercise. For beginners, there's a free skating lesson every Tuesday and Thursday. Ice Station, across the street from Valencia High. Call 775-8686 or check icestation.net for ice skating fun. Remember when mom would bake cookies and you'd sneak some raw cookie dough? Raw cookie dough is the best. And now you can get safe to eat raw cookie dough at Delicious Sweets and Treats at the Westfield Town Center Mall. Delicious Sweets and Treats raw cookie dough comes in several flavors like birthday cake, sugar cookie, unicorn, and everyone's favorite, chocolate chip. Not into the raw stuff? No worries. You can also get freshly baked cookies or buy the dough to bake yourself. Delicious Sweets and Treats near JCPenney's in the mall. Hi, Kirk Stinson here with Plumbing by Kirk, your hometown plumber. I want to stress to you how important it is to get proper advice on what to do in case of emergencies. Always know where your shutoff valves are to be able to isolate it and have the problem taken care of on regular hours and avoid expensive plumbing bill. We invite you to visit our website for free plumbing advice at plumbingbykirk.com or give us a call, 263-6519. That's 263-6519. My dad is the best plumber ever Call Plumbing by Kirk. If you're in danger of losing your home to foreclosure, you need an expert. Hi, I'm Rich Sherman with Alta Realty. I've helped hundreds of Santa Clarita residents save their homes completely for free. I've got just over 20 years' experience and a loan modification success rate of over 80%. I can negotiate better terms with your bank, and I can save your home from foreclosure. And again, we do this completely for free. So if you're in any danger, please call me today at 661-714-1400. That number again is 661-714-1400. I'm Rich Sherman with Alta Realty, and I'll be happy to help you save your home for free. Hometown. Hometown. Your hometown hometown station. I just like the variety of music. KHTS. Welcome back, everyone. Sharon Brubaker here, Certified Grief Recovery Specialist, and I am with Alex Urbina, Transformational Coach. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station. And just before the break, we were talking about how life happens even around a tragedy. And Alex, you were sharing a story how your dad was at at, at the end stages. You and your mom were having a moment, and your sister was sitting there eating a hamburger. And we talked about how you feel numb at times and how you're in a roller coaster of emotions during a tragedy and especially right when it's happening. And you, it was a funny moment for you guys, but it's still a lot of sadness was going on. Well, in hindsight, it became funny. Yeah. In the moment, I was trying to process 
how somebody could eat a sandwich when your dad's, you know, dying. So, right. um, which, like I said, it, it, it caused a whole new awareness for me to realize that I don't get to be in judgment. Yes. That's just how she chose to deal with it. Of There's course. No good, bad, right, or wrong. It just, it is what it, it is. It is. Yeah. Exactly. I agree with you. And I think from my experience is that we don't know how to be. So we're all trying to figure this out right when this moment happens. We're all trying to, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Should I be crying? But sometimes we don't feel like crying. Sometimes the tears don't come and that's okay. And sometimes you'll be sitting there, you're talking about your loved one and you um, can totally break out in tears or laughter. It was not uncommon for us to talk about Austin mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. He was a quirky little kid. We shared stories about him and I think that's what helped us. I think what happens when you he see life happening, like sister sitting there eating a hamburger, it just seems so odd in that place because it's not the way we picture it should be. But whatever we do, I want to just reach out to anyone who's listening. Whatever you do at that moment, it's okay. Yeah, it was actually, you know, now in hindsight, looking back, I realized it was part of the grieving process yeah. for us to laugh about it in a story afterwards. Right. The same way that when we had that, meeting it was coming back after the las vegas shooting here in santa Clarita. the child and family center hosted an event where yes. people were there to kind of learn how to continue to grieve and grieve in a healthy way afterwards when we were outside i had some family members that were actually there at the event and they came or uh, they were at the las vegas event and they also came that night right when it was over we uh sat outside in the in the in the dark right there in the parking lot still talking about it and they started laughing about like um, how it how so and so took off running, right. and 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 I realized in that moment that that was also part of the healing yes. process. That was yes. part of the grieving. Yes, was now that we're out of it, we got to this stage where we can laugh and giggle and make. And I guess it's trying to make sense of what 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 happened to process it out loud to other people. But I but I my heart recognized it as this is. A natural process you know that we're going through and it and, and it felt good too I agree I agree with you I think that you need that sometimes because it helps to get those true stories out there and honestly tell the truth as long as I didn't sit there from a rigid mindset saying this isn't right we right. shouldn't be laughing yeah and trying to put grieving in a box yes and so once I left it open and it all happened organically and and it was just part of the process my family is very sarcastic and it's not uncommon for a sarcastic remark to come out and so that is kind of how we deal with stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we have to accept it for what it is. And we have to literally go there. And remember, grief is unique and individual to each person. So you were losing dad. You were his son. You were losing your dad. Your mom was there. She was losing her lover and her friend. And your sister was losing her dad. But she was also hungry. So it, we each handle it in a different way. So I love that story, Alex. That's an amazing story. It really gets to show people that we're normal. Yeah. We're, grief is normal. Same thing, it's natural. Like I said, same thing with my older sister that once he did pass, she slowly um, like checked out. Yeah. She, she couldn't handle it. And now in hindsight, years later, she kind of thanked us, not directly but indirectly, right. by saying, uh, I think she wrote me a, a, an email basically saying like thank you for not judging me back then yeah i had a lot on my plate and I, and my my heart was broken to a certain point where i was lost and didn't know how to handle it right and so i'm so glad that i didn't go down that road and make her bad and wrong because she checked out it's just what what it was and if we accept that grief is unique and individual to each person then we know that each and every person is going to walk through their own process, right? And we need to give them that space. This happens a lot with couples where one will feel, you're not grieving enough. You're not grieving enough. We lost our son. You're not grieving enough. And the other one will feel, well, you're grieving too much. Or And it happens with brothers and sisters. It happens in families that we expect the other person to feel what we're feeling, mm -hmm. to be just as hurt or broken as we're feeling. But also remember, it depends on your relationship with that person. Were you complete? Were there things incomplete in that relationship that you need to handle maybe in a different way? Wouldn't it be awesome if we came up with some kind of a technology tool where I, I can put this on your head and you put it on my head and just for 60 yeah. seconds I can feel how you feel pain. Yeah. 
and then you can feel how I feel pain. And then when we feel it, we go, oh, I get it now. Right, all right. <laughs> like or now, trying to now see now the I experience. Under, now I understand yeah. why you're dealing it with what you're dealing with it in, a, in that way. Yeah. Rather than trying to figure out why you're not dealing with it in a certain way that makes sense to me. Right, absolutely. We were, just prior to the break, going over some emails that we had, Alex and I had received over the last uh, few months while we've been doing this special broadcast on grief, and we were breaking down one lady's um, email, but this also ties in with our what we're talking about right now. She says, my younger brother is starting to struggle and fall apart. I do not know how to help him because I can't even help myself. I have a religious background, but I'm not even going to church. So this is two different parts I tied in. But but as you were talking about that earlier, I was thinking to myself, you know, if I'm focused on you and trying yeah. to figure out why you're not grieving the way I think you should, I'm probably not focusing on my own grieving process. Yes. So is that that sounds common that a way to avoid my own grieving process is to look at someone else and then be in judgment of them right. and give them feedback. Exactly. Right? exactly. Instead of somebody going, wait a minute, what if you focused on you, I focused on me, and then and then whoever feels secure enough in that process to support each other will go there instead of me finding, try to find something in you to fix or tweak so it makes sense to me, but I just focus on what I'm going through and everyone just focus on themselves. That, that absolutely. And so, and you've heard me share this so many times and I think this is what's happening here with this young lady is, um, I had this need to be strong for Erica. I really thought it was my position was to be strong for her. And because I was being so strong for her, I was negating my own grief. I wasn't allowing my own grief to happen. And I wasn't going there because I was trying to be strong for her. Here, what's happening is she doesn't even know what to do for the brother, even though she feels she should be doing something. And my advice to you, her or anyone else that's trying to be the support system for someone is if you can imagine a big giant heart with two big giant ears just hanging off of it, just be the heart with ears, be the heart with ears for your brother. Allow him the space to talk to you. Because sometimes, and Alex, I, I, if you've ever experienced this, where it just builds up so much, I got to relieve some of this pressure, and I need a safe place to talk. And when I go and talk to someone, and they're constantly trying to correct me on how I'm feeling, you're still feeling that way? You're still grieving? They're not giving me the safe place to talk. And we, as grievers, need a place to talk and express how we're feeling about our loved ones. Yeah, not only am I not feeling safe, but I'm also feeling bad and wrong, like I'm not doing it the right way. Right. So then what's going to happen is slowly I'm going to want to go and either grieve it by myself somewhere else, or I'm going to try to, you know, or just hide out from everyone and just right. exclude myself. One of the things that she says here, which I thought was interesting, she said, I have recently started reading the obituaries daily. Yes. What's that about? On this, I think that um, because she's had so much loss over the last two years, is that she's afraid someone else, is she's going to lose someone else. And so I think she's literally looking, a couple of things. She's looking for someone else she may know that is going to die. And she's also looking to see if she can associate with people that are also grieving. Because Almost like looking for her tribe. Looking or? for her tribe, wow. exactly. Because we um, know for you a become, fact. You become part of a club almost. Exactly, I no, was going to say that. Yeah, That's so it, true. That's what I was going to say. Like when my dad died of cancer, as we were going through that process, I had this realization that for me up until that point, I hadn't, I hadn't known anybody in my right. inner circle that I, that was dealing with cancer. Right. It was always a friend's cousin or yeah. my neighbor's dad. But it would never it hit home so close right. that going through that experience is me and my wife uh, jumped on the Internet and we became uh, researchers for cancer. Right. But it was almost like we became part of this club, yes. you know, of whether it was cancer survivors or people that had lost people with cancer or it was just cancer itself or even or even death. Yeah. And so you kind of are looking maybe maybe subconsciously you're looking to see if, maybe if you're the only one going through it. And so as you see that other people are, are you know, uh, completing or transitioning their life right around this time, maybe it brings, makes you feel better or some comfort or something? Grievers need to be listened 
talked to and they need to be heard with respect. They need to know that someone is hearing them. And so what we do is we start to search out other grievers who will really understand our story, who really understand our pain, who really understand what a broken heart is. Unfortunately, is we'll find other grievers, and I'm grieving the loss of my mom, and then someone will say, I know exactly what you're feeling. My cat died. And grief is unique and individual. Yes, I can understand what a broken heart feels like, but I need to give them that space to talk yeah. and to share another and just thing, listen. Another thing I thought of when I read that she started reading the obituaries daily, I thought of that uh, junior detective syndrome that comes yeah. up when yeah. you're in a, a tragic event yeah. where you now it's your mission to go figure out what happened, what happened? find out the front story, the back story. Yeah. You're you know, watching the news and watching these uh these breaking news stories about the killer and the shooter. Yes. And before you know it, you're now chasing after everything news about what happened. Why Why do we do that? Is that way a way to avoid or is it to try to make sense of what happened so that in our mind we can put it at rest? That's the figuring out the why. That literally is the why. We know for a fact as grief recovery specialists that people that have uh, have tragedies or losses due to suicide or murder – it is not uncommon for them to chase that why. And they're so busy chasing the why, they negate their grief. They don't deal with their broken heart. They become the junior detectives, and they're constantly trying to figure that out, and they don't slow down long. Now, if they go after this chase to find the why, and they're negating to look at the healing part, and they finally go down that road six months, eight months, a year and a half, and they finally get their why, but they never really fully grieved, what happens to that grief? Do they just suppress it? Do yes. they stuff it? They suppress it. They stuff it. And sometimes it comes out in, in strange ways. So I have grievers that come to me and tell me that I was driving down the street and I got a flat tire. And I literally fell apart. I emotionally fell apart. I was crying uncontrollably. It didn't even make sense that I should be crying like this. Because that's the grief trying to come out. We're little teapots, and we got this pressure. It's trying. It's going to come out some way. So either we're going to use alcohol and drugs and sex and whatever we can to make ourselves feel better, or it's just going to come out in emotional anger and towards other family members it around even, us. It even comes out physically. Yes. As cold sores. Yes. Or you, you your breakout, like pimples, zits. I mean, it... It comes out. It's like a toxic energy. Yeah. Irritable bowel syndrome, yeah. high blood pressure, cancer, if, all of the things. You can internalize it to the point yeah. where it does the damage internally rather than validating that it's healthy for me to go through the process as daunting as it might feel or seem. But let's go through it so that we release that toxic energy out of us, yeah. out of our context so that we can free us up to, to move on and, and continue with our life. One of the things that happens, Alex, is that af over time, if we don't deal with our, our loss and our broken heart, whatever that brokenness is from, over time, the pain becomes comforting. The pain becomes who we are. It becomes our identity. And it also feels good to have that pain because at least I have a little bit of him still with me if my heart is broken. Like a badge. Yeah, like a badge. So she says here that... Um, I, uh, I have a religious background, but I'm, I'm not even going to church. Um, and she is basically trying to say here is that I have a faith in God, but even my faith is not helping me. Mm. We know for a fact that um, people have gone to their church and looked for help with their broken hearts, and they have been as best that they can, their, their uh, parishioners at church have tried to help them, and they're told to just pray about it, but it doesn't make them feel better. I'm absolutely a Christian. I love my church. I've been a member of my church for many years, but I know that people go where they are most comfortable, but sometimes they don't get those answers there, and that it surprises them. It's because our hearts are broken. We need to fix our broken heart, what's individual to each and every one of us. And then our religious walk and our faith will come back even twofold. If you're in your church and your church is totally helping you, I love that. I absolutely love that. But we know a lot of grievers go to where they're most comfortable and they don't, like ah, That's all don't right. get that uh, completion. <laughs> hey, just I turned on the Facebook Live. 
so so what happens so what happens when um there's there's uh when it goes to, when it goes to a certain point where we can't get ourselves out of our own way and that's yeah. when you know we look to see all right now what now yeah. now what do i do so i think that um one of the things we can do is definitely reach out to a person like you or myself or if you're in a place where you are comfortable and you are getting a person to help you and they are your heart with ears and they're giving you some of the uh, relief that you need, what's going to eventually happen is that relief is not going to be there for you anymore. It's mm -hmm. really about learning how to complete that loss. I'm not saying that um, her uh, religious walk is good or bad. I'm just saying that she possibly went there and this is what she shared with me that she went there and it just wasn't helpful to her. She just doesn't know how to fix everything that's wrong with her. So every avenue she's turning to is not the answer. And so she keeps coming up empty. And that doesn't mean that the answer's not out there. No, it's absolutely. Matter, it's a matter of, for you, your journey is a seven-step process yes. or a 12-step process. Yeah. For some of us, we just happen to have a village of people that either have been there, know what to do, and they can rally around us on the first attempt. Yes. For for some of us, we got to keep looking. But I think the, the the main crux of it is, is that you, it's your job to go on, go in search yes. to find the mechanism or the tool or the vehicle that you can jump on to go through that grieving process in a healthy way. In a healthy way that feels right to you, that feels okay, that you get that feeling that someone truly understands what you're going through. They truly understand where you are. They truly understand what a broken heart feels like. Now, can she be beating herself up because she has – a great um, opportunity to plug into her church. She just doesn't feel compelled to go there. So maybe that's what why she was commu communicating that to you in that email. It was like I go, I go to church. I just for whatever re uh, for whatever reason I'm not even going. Yes, it was kind of like she's outing herself, like yeah. letting you know, like I have this outlet, but I don't even feel uh, compelled to go. And I, it, it's not helping me is what she told me. She shared with me, it's just not helping okay, me. Got and it. so I think that's why she added that to the, the last part here was like, almost like if I sit and pray and I sit and pray with my brother, cause she added it right on the end of that. It's just not helping me. So there's multiple losses going on here and multiple areas that she needs to work on that she needs to go after. So let's say when you're, when you're dealing with, grief and loss it's maybe a four to eight or 12 component process and maybe praying is one of those components yes but it's not it's not the only component yes it's just a piece of the puzzle and so i think the takeaway for me is when you're hurting uh with a broken heart and you're dealing with loss it's up to you to figure out what all those components are and be in search of it. And there are people out there and there's articles out there and videos and there's a wealth of information to help walk you down that path. But you got to first be willing to embark on that journey. Right. And here's the other thing that I think is so important is that I need to love you and care for you as a grief recovery specialist where you're at. It is not uncommon for people to start questioning their faith at a time of loss you know, a mother who has lost a child, um, a, a woman who's lost her husband, to really question her faith uh, at that time. It's not uncommon for that. So if someone comes to me and they are 100% dialed in with their religion, I'm going to be there with you 100%. But if you're telling me I'm really upset at God right now, then I'm going to help you work through that as well. And that's what I want people to understand, that we have to give you the freedom to be where you are, and we're going to love you where you're at no matter what. But we know that this tragedy and this loss is not going to end your relationship with, with God. And, I, and what I love most about what you're saying is that I know that you are going to be that person for them without judgment. Yes. I think that's a key distinction. Yes. Because you can go somewhere else and have someone support you, but if you're... If you're with another Christian and you're saying, I'm doubting that God is not here for me, yeah. that other person can now be in judgment of yes, you. Yes, exactly. Then, and then you feel like you're not really being heard or understood, yeah. at least. Yeah. Well, from a neutral place, right? Exactly. So yeah. I'm going to listen to you where you're at, and I'm going to talk to you about where you're at. Um, everyone, stay tuned. This is Sharon Brubaker, Certified Grief Recovery Specialist, and Alex Urbina. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we have a couple of questions that came up on our Facebook Live, as well as me turning on my Facebook Live. But we're going to discuss that when we come back. KHTS, your hometown station. 
Let's go inside the mind of a 10-year-old. I should have worn earrings today. Buckle up, Sarah. Michaela's got, like, the best earrings. Sarah, buckle up. I wish my name was Michaela. We're not hitting the road until you buckle up, honey. Oh, yeah, seatbelt. I wonder if there's pizza at school today. It can be tough getting through to kids, but it's your job to make sure they're wearing your seatbelts. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. I've been into cars ever since I was six years old. I helped my dad build race cars in our driveway. Dave Reeves, owner of Reeves Complete Auto Center. I love cars. I've been in automotive service my whole life. I ran my dad's wrecking yard and rearing shop, managed several auto repairs until I opened my own auto repair facility. Reeves on Ruther in Canyon Country. I learned customer service and honest communication make the difference. Reeves, your complete auto service center. Call Reeves at 252-1400. Whether it's getting your degree, brushing up on your skills to get to the next level at work, or taking free college courses while in high school, College of the Canyons wants you to start your finish. COC offers classes in Valencia, Canyon Country, and online. Registration is going on now for the spring semester, which begins February 5th. Whatever your goals, COC can get you there. Visit canyons.edu today. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back. Sharon Brubaker here, your Certified Grief Recovery Specialist. I'm with Alex Urbina, Transformational Coach and my hero. We, you are listening to KHTS, your hometown station. We are doing a special broadcast on grief and loss. Today we've been answering some questions that Alex and I have received over the last couple of months while we've been doing this special broadcast, and we've just been going through the emails and answering those. Along with that, we are Facebook Live, and I want to thank everyone who is listening uh, to Facebook Live and actually typing in and uh, adding some questions. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much. I think it's amazing that you're always on every week. I just want to give you a shout out. But we have a question here from a young lady, and the question is, I don't know what to say to someone who is grieving. And so I'd like to address that real quick. Thank you so much for that question. There's really not that much that we can say in order to, um, in a way of making the person feel better. And I think a lot of times we approach the grieving person or the griever as if, how can I make them feel better? And sometimes they're numb. Sometimes they're just staring off into a distance. Sometimes they don't even hear what we're saying. So I do tell supporting team, family members, it's absolutely okay to say nothing if you're with them to just sit there, to just sit with them. Some of the things that I say is uh, you'll see me touch my heart a lot when people share. I'll grab my heart and I'll just be like, ouch, letting them know I know their heart's broken and that I, I'm feeling the pain with them. Sometimes I'll say to them, I can't even imagine what this must be like for you. I can't even imagine what losing your dad must be like for you. I try not to associate it back with myself, what my grief was like when I lost my dad. I will tell people a lot of times on social media, I will type in, if I was near you, I'd give you a hug right now. Just because that's, you know, really what people need. I'd just give you a hug. Sometimes when I'm near the griever and, and the first time I see them or even the first time I meet them, I just give them a hug. I don't say anything. I just give them a hug. There are no words that we can say that's going to make any griever feel better. There's nothing out there. Yeah, for me, when my dad uh, passed away, I think if I look back at some of the most powerful interactions I've had, either with family members or people that came up to me, you know, got in their car and just drove over because they love me or my dad or my family. And when they got there, if I can, you know, handpick a few of them that really just resonated with me, it was the ones that felt comfortable and confident and not saying anything. Yeah. And so what they did was they walked up to me and they stood in front of me and they held the space. They held the silence right. for me to look up and go, man, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. Had they had came and in that awkward silence, not know how to be in that awkward silence, they probably would have said something to me or, or whatever words that came out 
um, wouldn't really have done anything for me. Right. So when I think back about it, if you have the ability to just be there and yeah. and learn how to hold the silence or hold a space for them, yeah. L- that space lets them know that I can trust you and now I need to say something. Yes. Because they want to say something. Right. Their heart is broken. They they want to either look up and acknowledge you for being there or how much it means to them. Or maybe they just want to look up and go, man, I wasn't ready for this. or you know. But that can't happen if you come with all of your right. fears and all of you know projecting your own fears and, and trying to find the right words. There are none. Right, exactly. So, so to me, I just love when, you, when somebody can show up, be there, and just eat, or even just linger and just kind of hang out. You know, sometimes I look around and at that moment because it looks like a, it feels like a fog. Right. But I would look around. I'd see my uncle standing there and I'd look and see my couple of my cousins. And when when I'm greeting people, if I looked over and made eye contact, they would just wink at me. You yeah. know, those, those, those I'm giving goosebumps just thinking yeah. about that because their silence said a lot. Their silence let me know how that they were there for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is so important. Now, there are other things that people will say that they think is helpful. Um, and most times to the griever, especially immediately following, these are not helpful, but things such as, um, at least he's not suffering anymore. He's no longer in pain. Doesn't it make you feel better to know that he's in a better place? That was just shared with me last night in my grief class. Someone heard that. And she said in her head, she was like, no, it doesn't make me feel better. But she said she agreed with the lady because she thought that's what she wanted to hear. It is not uncommon for supporting staff and members, and I'm calling supporting staff, but our, our support team went with the grieving experience, to want to take us away from the heart. Take us away from really what's feeling going on in our heart, those broken heart emotions, and try to put us in our head and go intellectual. It is not uncommon for mm-hmm. people to do that. Isn't I, it crazy? I agree. I as agree. we as a society, that that's what we will do to help we feel like we're helping someone. I have this scenario. It's funny. I talk about um, intellectual people. Yes. And um, in the training room, sometimes I'll say, have you ever been in, a, let's say you guys are all gathering, someone passed away in the family, and you have a very intellectual person who lives up in his or her brain in their head, but they don't know how to just be in the moment. Yeah. And they feel uncomfortable in that awkwardness. And one of those intellectual people, those analyzers, will in that awkwardness, they'll make, they'll make a joke yeah. to break the ice. Yes. And then everyone kind of looks at each other and they just kind of, you know, they look away. They just kind of shake their head and no fault. It's not a, their fault. Right. It's just that they're so uncomfortable with, you know, being uncomfortable. And if you're uncomfortable being uncomfortable, we, we just open up our mouth and we put our foot in it yes, sometimes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so that's what I visualize when that analyzer comes in and he or she's not used to just being the space or connected or feeling your pain. And so that they have to go to their head and find some words. Right. And a lot of times the words don't do justice. They right? don't do justice yeah. or they don't help. But we accept them, just like what the young lady shared with yeah. me when the lady said to her, aren't you happy that she's in a better place? And it's the same thing like my sister who ate the sandwich. Right. It's, it's how they deal with it. So yes. you have to not you know, be in judgment of them and make them bad and wrong. It's just how they're dealing with it. Right. And the other thing that will happen, Alex, is that time after time when we're getting these uh, intellectual comments that are being repeated to us and people are taking us from our heart to our head, we realize we don't have a safe place to talk. Remember, grievers need to be listened to and heard with respect. They need those heart with ears. We, we feel that we don't have that safe place. So we almost start walking around with these Academy Award-winning behaviors, and we start acting recovered, even though we're not recovered, because we know there's no place for us to talk. No one wants to hear our story. Or it's been so much time, people have told us they don't want to hear that story. Or you start to share that moment in your heart, and the person says, you know, they cut you off, and they say, man, did you see that football game on Friday? They changed the subject, letting you know they don't want to hear what you have to say. So it is not uncommon for the grievers to start acting recovered, even though they're not recovered. Wow. So you'll see them, and you'll run into them. I realized that. Yes, it's And we huge. probably got a lot of them from Vegas, because the world has already moved on to 20 other tragedies. Yeah. And they now maybe feel like I have to move on and they start to pretend that they that they're healed. And they'll tell that number one lie that you and mm. I talk about all the time when you ask them how they're doing and they'll say, I'm fine because they don't feel it's a safe place to talk. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was a powerful show. Uh, 
see you next week. KHTS, your hometown station, Grieving from Within.